two years of brutal war in Ukraine, a country forever scarred, and a frozen, deadly stalemate. Eastern Europe fears Putin's next steps and U.S. abandonment. It is not by accident that the closer you are to Russia, the, the, the more you're spending on defense. And the death of Alexei Navalny. The U.S. and Navalny's family blame President Vladimir Putin. If this is true, I want Putin and his entire entourage to know that they will bear responsibility for what they have done with our country, with my family, and with my husband. This is PBS News Weekly. I'm Nick Schifrin. It has been two years since Russia launched a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Many in Washington feared Kyiv would fall in four days. Today, Ukraine still stands, but bears the burden of Russia's total war. In two years, countless wives, now widows, sons, now orphans. The dead stolen of their dignity and 10 million forced to flee their homes, the largest refugee crisis since World War II. Every one, everywhere, carries the war's scars. And so Ukraine fights. 300,000 soldiers are determined, but exhausted, outmanned, and increasingly outgunned. In some areas, for every artillery shell they fire, Russian soldiers fire 10. Two years ago today, before the full-scale invasion, Russia occupied 7% of Ukraine. On March 22, 2022, Moscow expanded control to 27%. Ukraine has won back about half that newly captured territory, but Russia still occupies 18%. Recently, Ukraine pushed the Russian Navy further back into the Black Sea, increased exports, and now increasingly threatens occupied Crimea. But it recently lost the eastern city of Avdivka. The Russian military has momentum as Ukraine waits for U.S. aid, without which senior U.S. officials fear Ukraine will lose. To take stock of where the war is today, we spoke to three analysts, Michael Kaufman of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, Rebecca Heinrichs of the Hudson Institute, and John Mearsheimer of the University of Chicago. Thanks so much, uh, all of you. Welcome back to the News Hour. Michael Kaufman, let me start with you. Uh, as we just said, Ukraine has lost Avdivka. They're increasingly outgunned, uh, outmanned. How bad is it? Look, Ukraine starts 2024 in a very difficult position. That is very clear. Ukraine has a deficit in terms of artillery ammunition. Part of that is because it depends on Western support for munitions. And it has a deficit of manpower. It needs to replenish the force, particularly the infantry component of the force. Now. While it's true that Russia is materially advantaged in this war, that much is clear. If we look at manpower, particularly if we look at artillery, to a lesser extent equipment, that advantage at this stage is not decisive either. The battle for Avdiivka, which was a five-month grinding fight, tells us about the challenges both militaries face. Ukraine was forced to retreat after fighting a defensive battle, but it inflicted very high costs on the Russian military. It cost the Russian military almost an entire army's worth of equipment, and equipment remains the limiting factor for them. Right. So that being said, this year is clearly looking like a year during which Ukraine is going to focus most likely much more on holding, defending, trying to rebuild and reconstitute the force, and maybe creating challenges for the Russian armed forces with expanded strike campaigns. Rebecca Heinrichs, do you agree with that assessment? Uh, and do you think the U.S. needs to go further than it has so far in its support? I do agree with Mike's assessment. Um, you can look at all of the things that have not been going well for Ukraine. The Ukraine has clearly demonstrated um, an amazing ability to make gains and retake territory, strong will to fight, stronger and greater sense of national identity. And so what Ukraine needs now into the next year, agree with Michael, it needs to um, uh, be resupplied, but also longer range strike systems, um, drones, bigger drones that can carry longer range strike systems in order to reach uh, Russian targets, not just in Ukraine, but outside Ukraine in the Russian territory. So, John Mearsheimer, what do you think about that, that uh, all that uh, Ukraine needs to do is hold the line and that the U.S. should increase its support for Ukraine uh, over the coming years uh, in order for Ukraine to be able to achieve what it needs to? Well, I disagree. Uh, I think that Ukraine has already lost the war. Uh, it's lost 20 percent of its territory, according to my calculations, and it's not going to conquer that territory and get it back as was demonstrated in the failed counteroffensive of last year. The key to understanding where this war is headed is to know 
that it is a war of attrition. This is two armies that are standing toe to toe and beating the living daylights out of each other. And the question is, which army bleeds which army first? And it's quite clear that the Russians are bleeding the Ukrainians white. As the setup piece made clear, the Russians have an about a 10 to 1 advantage in artillery. And there's nothing we can do to fix that in the foreseeable future, because we don't have artillery on the shelf that we can give them. Furthermore, in terms of manpower, they are in absolutely terrible shape. They say they need a mobilization and will bring into the force 500,000 troops. They are not going to be able to mobilize 500,000 troops. In my opinion, they'll be lucky if they can mobilize 150,000 troops. And they're already greatly outnumbered by the Russians, because the Russian population is five times bigger than the Ukrainian population. So when you look at the metrics that really matter in a war of attrition, the Ukrainians are in a terrible situation, and this situation only gets worse with time. Michael Kaufman, take on those points, that there's not enough artillery to send them, that they will not have enough manpower, and, quote, Ukraine has already lost. Okay. First of all, I just have to disagree on the facts. The United States has plenty of artillery, just doesn't have the money. And artillery production, both in the United States and the European Union, is increasing significantly. We will be in a much better position by 2025 than we are now. Second, Russia's fire's advantage right now is about five to one. It's not a decisive fire's advantage given the main constraints the force has. Third, when it comes to manpower, there's a lot more to military analysis than basic algebra. It's much more about how you use the forces you have and your ability to convert your resources into combat-capable and effective formations. Russia has a lot more people on paper. That is true. But the Russian forces in Ukraine don't actually outnumber the Ukrainian troops on the front line by that much at all. Russia is feeding off of a Soviet legacy, pulling equipment from its warehouses. It lost a ton of it over the Battle of Divka. It can't keep doing that too many times. All right? and if Russia is not on track and doesn't look like they're actually really winning this war, by the time we get into 2025, their negotiating position becomes actually very uncertain. Rebecca Heinrichs is... Ukraine already losing? And is it a rump state, as John Mersheimer said? No, of course not. The United States currently has ready to send to Ukraine as soon as Congress gives a go-ahead and passes this national security supplemental. We've also seen the United States and other Western companies be able to adapt actually very quickly, increase the production of key munitions, and kick them over to the battlefield very, very quickly. Um, so for the medium and long term, it does have the ability to produce these weapons to get them to Ukraine if there is uh, the will to do so. And so this isn't uh, just all uh, good and positive things going for, for Russia. It does have to look elsewhere also. And so the same situation is for Ukraine. It's going to look to the West. John Mearsharp, I want to take on those points. One, that the U.S. and Europe are increasing their production to be able to send to Ukraine. Uh, and two, that in general, Russia does not have the decisive advantage that you think it does clear from almost all the accounts in the media that the Russians have roughly a 10 to 1 advantage in artillery. If uh, Michael's correct that the artillery is on the shelf, uh, why don't we give it or why haven't we given it to the Ukrainians? And the fact is, it's not on the shelf. We don't have the artillery tubes or shells to give to them. And he says that we'll make a substantial improvement in that regard by 2025. Uh, I would remind him that this is February 2024, and we have a lot of months to go before we get to 2025. Uh, and if you look at the Russians, they have a significant industrial base that can pump out lots of weapons, and they're doing exactly that, which is why they have a 10 to 1 advantage. Furthermore, if you look at manpower, uh, there are some reports that the average age of Ukrainian forces is 43 years old. They're having a significant problem with draft dodgers back in Kiev and other places in Ukraine. Uh, this mobilization is not going to be able to produce 500,000 troops. And Zaluzhny and other generals have said they need 500,000 troops because the Russians have much larger numbers of troops. So in a war of attrition, if you're outnumbered in terms of artillery and you're outnumbered in terms of manpower, you're really in big trouble. And you saw this in Avdivka, where the Ukrainians just suffered a humiliating defeat. Michael Kaufman, what is victory for Ukraine, and can it achieve it? Now, what does victory look like? Ukraine is able to achieve an end to the war on terms favorable to itself that does not involve a sacrificing any significant amount of sovereignty 
or compromising its economic viability as a state. And ideally, and most importantly, Ukraine avoids having to negotiate from a position of weakness where Russia achieves a victor's peace. And I think that's possible and it's still feasible at this point, but I won't argue that Ukraine does not have a difficult path ahead of it. Rebecca Heinrichs, you talk about attacking inside Russia. Some U.S. officials, as you know, are worried about escalation. Do you think they should be? To end this war on terms that favor Ukraine, to give Ukraine the strongest hand to play to end this conflict, that, that leaves itself with a strong hand and to protect itself from, from further incursions, is to make sure that Ukraine can inflict pain on Russia so that Russia decides that it's no longer uh, worth the risk and the cost to continue moving forward. To do that, you have to inflict pain. And Russia can no longer be a sanctuary for where it is launching its attacks and where its, its logistics are. So Ukraine has already been hitting some of those targets. It's just not been permitted to do so with with Western weapons, and that needs to change if we're going to actually change the tide of the war and enable Ukraine, as Michael said, to, to have a strong hand to play to end this war. John Mearsheimer, final word. And I just want to point out that you want to understand that we armed up and we trained the Ukrainians for a major counteroffensive last summer, and that counteroffensive was a colossal failure. And given what's happened since then, there is no reason to think that the Ukrainians can go on the offensive and win a war against the Russians. And if anything, it's quite clear that the balance of power over time has shifted in the Russians' favor, and it's likely to continue to shift further in the Russians' favor moving forward. So we are in deep trouble in Ukraine. John Mearsheimer, Rebecca Heinrichs, Michael Kaufman, thank you very much to all of you. Alexei Navalny was Russia's leading opposition politician and most public critic of Vladimir Putin. Russian authorities say the 47-year-old died early last Friday in the remote Arctic prison where he was serving a 19-year term. We take a look at Navalny's legacy. He went from being Vladimir Putin's staunchest critic to leading Russia's strongest anti-corruption movement and eventually Russia's most prominent political prisoner. I believe, I am confident and declare that they are not the masters of our country and never will be. And a huge number of people agree with me. Russian prison authorities announced Alexei Navalny died in a penal colony in the Arctic Circle, where he was serving a 19-year sentence on extremism charges widely seen as politically motivated. In a statement, prison services said Navalny felt ill after a walk and, quote, almost immediately losing consciousness. He was last seen in yesterday's court hearing, alive but gaunt after three years in prison, and seemingly laughing and well. His wife, Yulia Navalnaya, took the stage at Munich's security conference hours after he was reported dead. We cannot believe Putin and Putin's government. They always lie. But if this is true, I want Putin and his entire entourage to know that they will bear responsibility for what they have done with our country, with my family, and with my husband. And this day will come very soon. President Biden was unequivocal. Make no mistake. Putin is responsible for Navalny's death. Putin is responsible. What has happened to Navalny is yet more proof of Putin's brutality. The son of a military officer, Alexei Navalny, was born in the village of Butin, outside of Moscow. In the late 1990s, he earned a law degree from Moscow's Friendship of the People's University and grew into Russia's most well-known political opposition figure, crusading against corruption. He called Putin's United Russia Party, quote, the party of crooks and thieves. He led mass protests in 2011 and again in 2012, when it was clear President Putin would regain the presidency. Our Margaret Warner interviewed Navalny then. This is not an election. This procedure is aimed at only one thing, the appointment of Prime Minister Putin once again the president, seemingly for life. In 2013, he broke into politics with a mayoral run in Moscow, and though he didn't win, he did beat the incumbent Putin-backed mayor. House arrest followed in 2014 for embezzlement and later convictions on fraud and money laundering, charges Navalny denied. Despite being barred from running, in 2016 he announced he would run against Putin for the presidency in 2018. More arrests and repression followed. A 2017 detention for an unsanctioned rally, one of the country's largest opposition demonstrations in years. 187 cities, tens of thousands of Russians, all protesting corruption. 
Despite repeated threats, Navalny forged on with his anti-corruption foundation, investigating Russia's elite and bypassing state-run media with YouTube videos garnering millions of views. This is our country, and these swindlers are stealing our money. Everyone should fight however he can. His fight nearly killed him once already. In 2020, Navalny was in a coma for two weeks after being poisoned by a lethal nerve agent. Russia denied poisoning him, but a recorded call to a Russian intelligence agent featured in this 2022 CNN documentary revealed the poison was planted in his underpants. Despite being evacuated to Germany for treatment, Navalny made the decision to return to Russia in 2021. He was jailed as soon as he landed in Moscow and has been behind bars ever since. Navalny himself saw this day coming. My message for the uh, situation when I am killed is very simple, not give up. In the days that followed, Russian authorities confirmed Navalny's death, but so far have refused to release his body. The U.S. responded, pushing new sanctions against Russia in response to both the ongoing war in Ukraine and Navalny's death. His wife, Yulia, released a video vowing to continue her husband's fight. By killing Alexei, Putin killed half of me, half of my heart, and half of my soul. But I still have the other half, and it tells me that I have no right to give up. I will continue the work of Alexei Navalny, continue to fight for our country. I urge you to stand next to me, to share not only my grief and endless pain, but also to share the rage. Navalny's cause of death remains unknown. Russian authorities blocked Navalny's mother from the morgue where her son's body is believed to be held. Across Russia, more than 50,000 people have now signed a petition demanding Navalny's body be released. In Moscow, Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov blasted Western leaders who've blamed Putin for Navalny's death. An investigation is underway, and all necessary actions in this regard are being carried out. But so far, the results of this investigation have not been made public, and in fact, they're unknown. Therefore, in conditions when there is no valid information, we believe that it is absolutely inadmissible to make such well, frankly, boorish statements. Makeshift memoirs have popped up across Russia as mourners pay tribute to Navalny's legacy. He was a very strong person, and I think all of Russia is suffering because we lost such a hero. In St. Petersburg, men clad in black removed flowers from a memorial, carrying them away in garbage bags. But moments later, Navalny's supporters returned to replace them. Other memorials have also been dismantled across the country, and police have detained nearly 400 people for attending events commemorating Navalny's death. With less than a month to go before Russia's national election, and with Putin's victory all but certain, Navalny's death further scatters and weakens an already thin opposition movement. Navalny died just as world leaders gathered at the annual Munich Security Conference in Germany. During the conference, I spoke with Kaya Kallis, the Prime Minister of Estonia, a former Soviet Republic. A recent Estonian intelligence assessment said Russia is preparing for military confrontation with the West within the next decade. I asked her if that confrontation could be prevented. It can be prevented if we invest in our defense, because if you think about the aggressor, uh, the aggressor takes the step of attacking somebody when he thinks that he can win because the other side is weaker. So we haven't taken, uh, taken the defense seriously enough, and that means all the NATO allies have to do more. We've been focusing on Europe, but I want to ask about the U.S. Is the United States a reliable partner? Of course, uh, all these, uh, these uh, statements uh, from the uh, United States are making us uh, worried uh, because the uh, United States has been the biggest ally. And uh, I mean, the only time Article 5 has been used is when U.S. called us. So um, uh, this is something that we need to do together. I mean, when you have aggression p uh, that pays off some part in the world, it will invite other aggressors in the world to start wars uh, elsewhere. 
Poland is one of the former Soviet satellite states along NATO's eastern flank that is anxious about American commitment both to Ukraine and Europe. In Munich, I also sat down with Poland's Foreign Minister Radosław Sikorski and asked how his country views the U.S. congressional debate over support for Ukraine. As of now, the U.S. House of Representatives uh, has not approved vital military aid to Ukraine. Already, as we know, Ukraine is rationing ammunition. What impact is the debate in the U.S. having on American credibility? Well, first of all, remember that Europe has contributed financially more to the effort uh, than the United in States. Total. In total. When yeah. you count uh, Brussels and the member states. Mm -hmm. Secondly, remember that this is money for weapons to be manufactured in the United States. Thirdly, the Ukrainians have already destroyed half of uh, President Putin's army without the involvement of a single American uh, soldier. And lastly, that um, it's much cheaper to help Ukraine now than it will be if Putin conquers Ukraine and then has to be deterred. So we think this is good value for money uh, and that this uh, package is, uh, is important. We appeal to the House of Representatives to Mike Johnson personally. Speaker of the House, yeah. To please let it go to a vote. Do you believe it is damaging U.S. credibility? Well, if Ukraine, having been encouraged to resist, uh, the President of the United States having um, put his standard on the ground in Kiev, in the famous historic visit, then doesn't deliver on assistance, that would send a message around the globe that um, that you have to be careful because uh, the United States, for important uh, but uh, uh, regrettable reasons, might not be able to come through for you. Be careful, you mean trusting the United States in the future. And that would have important implications, not only in Eastern Europe, but around the globe, where there are other allies that feel exposed, uh, um, bordering on more powerful countries. Japan, Korea, uh, Taiwan, others, uh, Philippines, Australia even. Um, and so the world is watching. Uh, this, this really is not only about Ukraine. Can Europe make up the shortfall for Ukraine if the U.S. does not send military aid? We can make up financially, but there is literally not enough production capacity of shells and of equipment. Uh, we are 20 times bigger than Russia economically, but Russia has gone on to a war footing. It's producing uh, ammo 24-7. We haven't. And without the United States, we are behind the curve in making the stuff that Ukraine needs to, to defend itself. Many people here have admitted that Ukraine could lose without these weapons, but can Ukraine win with these weapons? It has struggled to even match its own uh, goals for the counteroffensive last year. Uh, Ukraine has recovered 50% of the territory that the Russians once occupied, and Ukraine has cleared the Russian Navy from half of the Black Sea and is now exporting grain, not thanks to Putin's uh, permission, but uh, despite his best, best efforts. Um, we, they just need the tools to do the job. They are doing God's work on our behalf. We just need to uh, enable them because they can't defend themselves with bare hands. If Ukraine doesn't get these weapons, should it negotiate an end of the war? Uh, well, then it will be uh, U.S. responsibility for having brought that about, for having um, um, allowed Putin to abolish Tab a taboo that we established after two bloody world wars, that you may not change borders by force. Uh, it will then get noticed by dictators uh, and aggressors around the world. That yes, the West will huff and puff, the America will, that America will encourage to fight, but when it comes, uh, when push comes to shove, you can get away with it. And that would then be, be a very costly proposition. I notice, though, you don't say no. I mean, do you think Ukraine should negotiate into the war if it doesn't have enough weapons? Look, I've said it before. There is never a shortage of pocket chamberlains willing to trade other people's freedom or land for their own peace of mind. The, if it were to come to pass, these should be Ukrainian judgments. It's their people who are being conquered, who are being uh, 
uh, expel their children who are being stolen, not ours. I know you're not going to want to talk about U.S. domestic politics, but I do have to ask about comments made by the former president recently in which he questioned whether NATO should defend countries that don't meet the 2 percent threshold of GDP spending uh, in terms of defense spending. Do you believe the damage has already been done in some ways, that the very questioning of Article 5, the idea that the U.S. would come to European defense, no matter which European country was attacked inside of NATO. Do you think that's already damaged Article 5? Uh, we, held, we heard uh, Secretary General of NATO, uh, Jens Stoltenberg, reporting to the uh, Munich Security Conference that this year 18 NATO allies will uh, be spending uh, at least 2 percent. Poland, I think, is number one, actually. Um, uh, so let's, uh, let's hope that uh, what the former president meant was to uh, uh, energize us, to uh, accelerate the increase of defense budgets. Is we prefer to remember that uh, under his administration, the U.S. sent anti-tank weapons uh, to Ukraine. Is 18 countries out of 31, presumably soon to be 32, is that enough? Countries meeting their 2 percent threshold? Uh, we, but some countries are behind the curve. The flank countries are not. Uh, it's not by the eastern flank. It is not by accident that the closer you are to Russia, the more, the, the more you're spending on defense. Foreign Minister Scorsi, thank you very much. Thanks. And that's PBS News Weekly. I'm Nick Schifrin. From all of us here, thanks so much for watching.